From the very beginning, let me say it once again. My name is Pavel Filipov. Here you can see the head of the project, New Generation Airships and Nova Company. So please turn the camera to see further. Uh, today, Fyodor will share with us some news about what has happened over the last week, the week that has passed since the main, since the first announcement. And Dmitry Knell, this is one of the key participants of the team that uh, will be developing and designing airships. And he is deputy of chief designer from Aerostatica company. So please uh, write more technical questions questions of how dirigibles will fly, how they work, you know, which solutions will be used in our case. So today you will be able to receive answers to many technical questions. And once again, well, I will try to speak louder and I hope that you can hear me well. So once again, what's going on? Oh, one week has passed since the first announcement where we publicly announced that we started to actively prepare for our project and now we're having the first pre-launch stage if you would like to see the rates that we have accumulated you can do that we have a link with all public financial information you can see that approximately one hundred fifty thousand dollars actual payments have already been received approximately 700 investors joined us it means that approximately that is 100 people per day are joining us and uh, approximately 2.5 million dollars are in installments already this is the money that will reach the project within three to five years depending on the installments that people buy and, and please note that today we have a pre-launch stage so there can be some changes regarding marketing plan but today it is normal because i can say that we are preparing this project and please note that now while it is all going on and you can monitor the pre-launch of this project you can invest uh, with the current conditions that are twice more attractive than the conditions that we will have at the first investment stage with the beginning of the first stage of finance and the shares will be twice as expensive so if you trust solar group if you are ready to enter the project now uh, so we are thankful to such people that are our most loyal investors and we are ready to give them the best investing conditions and i'd like to point out that initially they mentioned that 2.5 million dollars of actual payments are planned to be raised within pre set start stage now we think that this is too much sergey simonov on tuesday said that this amount will be decreased and according to the preliminary information one million dollars will be raised within the first pre-start stage so if you are thinking now or please remember that you do not have much time left and you have an advantage that most investors of solar group are not aware that a new project was launched i mean that there is no website no materials and the webinar is the main information that exists now so please attend the webinars because you have an opportunity to get information and this will be regular tuesday is presentation for thursday is technical webinar with technical experts and i would also like to point out uh, for all our partners that to start receiving referral bonuses within the project new generation airships you need to fulfill marketing plan today or tomorrow we will publish a detailed post with all explanations and now once again i will try to explain it to you with voice because before the webinar i saw that partners do not understand this information appropriately number one if uh, you did not have any structure in solar group you are a new partner then without any limitations well probably you shouldn't put the camera that far so without any limitations you can raise investments in dune of motors project and new generation airship project you can get referral or bonus without any additional services if you are a current partner of solar group and now you register a new investor it means that uh, without any limitations you can get a referral bonus from the investments to the first project and the second project i hope that uh, this is very clear and uh, where do we have the main issues 
these are investors that were present in your structure before the launch of a different investment project. If you want to get referral bonus from your current investors, when they invest into a new project, you need to fulfill a small marketing plan. Number one, you need to make a repost. Now, what kind of repost you can find this bottom on our landing that is devoted to the new investment project in the personal account. I guess that you can do it quite easily. And the second condition is that you need to buy an investment package for at least $2,000, but it can be done in installments. And number three, within this investment state prod package for $2,000, you need to make actual payments for the amount of at least $500. And the final condition, so you can select any of these conditions, actually, you can either personally invest $10,000 and that's it. In this case, you already start receiving this referral bonus or you can attract three investors in the first line. Each of them will invest $500 of actual payments. You can fulfill this condition as well. In that case, the marketing plan is considered to be fulfilled. And the third possible condition is that you can attract 10 investors in your first line. Each of them will invest $50. So these are three conditions. You can fulfill one of them. And in that case, the whole marketing plan will be fulfilled. Well, it may seem a bit complicated, quite a lot of items, but actually, uh, these items are really simple. I've tried to explain them consecutively, and I think that this task is not complicated at all to continue receiving referral bonus within your partner's status. And I'd like to point out that Solar Group has fulfilled its all its obligations. We have completely preserved all of your structures, and you can continue working within the teams that you have with the experience, the knowledge, and probably it will be even more efficient in future. And I would also like to point out that until you fulfill this marketing plan, your investors will buy investment packages, but you will not get referral bonuses with, from them and it will not return to you. I mean, it's not like it was accrued and after that you will be able to take it. No, as soon as you do that, you will make money from the investors that you had before. I hope that I've managed to explain it to you now. Many people are asking if some structures would be deleted or not, if some partners would be deleted. But no, actually, quite a lot of questions were received. But this is a technical webinar. And uh, when you give the floor to Pavel Filipov, you make it a financial webinar once again. Indeed, there are quite a lot of questions. And I was asked questions as well. So um, I was also asked, your project is really cool. What kind of rules do you have? I would like to take part in your project. Well, as Pavel said, quite soon, all the information will be described. Yes, further, I can give you the floor. So let's move to the technical part. So could you please share the news? OK, the news. So, um, for several weeks, we have been working, doing something, and now we'll see what we were doing. The main thing is that we signed an agreement for joint activities. Aristotica company, Alexander Kirillin, and uh, this company, Nova company. This is the company that will implement the project that will include Aristotica and our collective investor and uh, this agreement was signed. I'd like to congratulate all of you on it. We've agreed how we will cooperate, how we will move in future. It was on the uh, oral agreement, but now it is on paper. So that is a really important milestone for us. And apart from this agreement, uh, we have uh, to sign an agreement with Krilovsky Business Center, where the design bureau will be, where the designers will stay, 1,000 square meters, quite a lot of offices. And uh, in addition to this office, uh, we are also preparing our IT image, because this is high-tech story. I mean, that they will have to design to calculate, and there will be some service that will calculate and responsible for computation where everything will be stored and this has been formed now and we want it to be harmonious we want everything to be interconnected that's why we found a really cool expert that uh, will administer all of that and assemble all of that and uh, that is 
within the establishment of design bureau in this business center and we also found an administrative service it's really important because these people will be responsible uh, for all administrative issues in the office so that everyone would have paper internet would work everything would work and uh, yes uh, finding such a responsible person uh, was not easy we found him and that is also good news about this office and uh, we also conducted negotiations about utilities and uh, land because we need to build it we need uh, to uh, commission it as i had we received quite a lot of proposals uh, from various era cities various town area towns various towns in moscow region Smol smolensk region even the napa and we're discussing all uh, it with all of them and i guess that that we have selected the best option for us next week we will sign an agreement with them and i will announce who it is i'm sure that you will like it this place is really cool this is an attraction point for tourists and thanks to our theme it will be really good so i guess that that was pretty clear so strategic session we conducted a strategic session probably pavel can share it well yes solar group also goes in parallel with the project last week all the managers of solar group got together in one place and for several days we worked very fruitfully we uh, described all the tasks that should be fulfilled and uh, we uh, worked within the new project and the old project so all the issues related to website video content graphics all of that will be done we have set all the tasks and we will report how we're doing that so from our side uh, from cell group side to uh, the team has been prepared and uh, speaking about this new enterprise that will develop uh, dirigibles the team has been formed as well alexander kirill is already hiring employees they're signing agreements so i mean that in this area uh, some work is being conducted of course and speaking about land i have a very good piece of news but i guess that's more about media part so, you know, there's a city of Kirjach, and in this city, uh, there is a dirigible drone that is not active now. And this weekend, we will go there together with Mitri uh, Sergeyevich and, and cameraman. We will see the machines that they have. They will share their history with us. I guess that we will take uh, designers that designed uh, these devices, took part in their use in their development they will tell what they have done we will see all of that we will see uh, the gondols gondolas we will even see uh, air estates we will discuss them as well so i mean that uh, we will deliver develop content on saturday please wait for it speaking about news we're actually moving forward so uh, there is also an interesting piece of news oh, oh, so what will we talk about today with Dmitry Sergeyevich. Uh, we've agreed that we will launch several uh, stratosphere probes uh, with direct broadcastings. And this company will not only be working with dirigibles and stratosphere uh, airships, but uh, very soon we will be able to go to stratosphere with our load, um, do what we want to do, we will show what we can do, we will show that we are able to do that, and I guess it's quite probable that a um, commercial story will start really soon, and today we will discuss it. Yes, uh, active work has started, we're not waiting for anything. Dmitry Sergeyevich is saying that to the end of summer we will launch our first vehicle. Um, could you please speak a bit louder? We will do our best. Yes. So Dmitry Sergeyevich is responsible for stratosphere air states. It has been his hobby for a long time and it has become his profession as well. He can calculate everything and he, he can speak about it in more details. 
сказать, что мы целимся в стратосферные дирижабли, запускать уже эти летные стратосферные So, uh, we will launch stratosphere vehicles this summer. I guess that this news is really cool. So I saw a comment that said that this project is really big and complicated. I guess that the first airships will be launched in 10 years, but actually it's not the case. In the very beginning, we'll be able to show something, not only show something, not only probes. We know that quite a lot of such probes have been launched, but they will be very advanced. And uh, Dmitry Sergeyevich will explain how they are different from the ones that existed before, how we will be able to make money on them. So Dmitry Sergeyevich, so I will try to speak in details. I guess that you know that aerostatics uh, develops a stratosphere platform, stratosphere airship besides the approach that is conducted by Alexander Nikolaevich. Speaking about stratosphere will allow this airship to be used for a long time and to be very reliable. And this will be achieved. Actually, there is a separate lecture about it. A deputy chief designer will speak about it and I can speak about myself. I actually have worked with all types of airships, air states as well, and stratosphere airships that can become an alternative to satellites. Although you know that today, in the space, there are quite a lot of satellites the launch of such satellites on Earth in stratosphere can solve quite a lot of tasks. And there are quite a lot of advantages there. But for this purpose, we need to pass through the bottleneck of technical issues. And uh, contemporary technologies are only learning how to do that. These are uh, high efficient solar panels energy accumulators and many other things and that has been considered now so there are such platforms are based on highly efficient fuel for example liquefied hydrogen or some other types of high efficient fuel I've started all of that, and I hope that my knowledge will be useful. Now we have some understanding how to calculate logistics, logistic characteristics. And I just want to mention that it's quite difficult to make a dirigible controllable. That's why we need to take into account the atmosphere flow. And it is studied now, just like before, with the probes. I mean, these are small air estates, latex balloons most frequently, they go up and uh, their movement is measured. And um, quite a lot of people study it as a hobby because it's quite simple, it's quite cheap, and you can use this way to go up in the sky quite high. So it's possible to lift a camera or some device. And still it is applicable. And so it is quite reasonable and applicable. For example, high quality air photo shooting. There are some air states that use uh, balloons to lift to lift optical equipment, make photos. 
and uh, a client can get very qualitative pictures of very high quality, something that can be received from the orbit. And it's, it is, it can be quite difficult to get such photos. And when we speak about a remote probing of land, you know, the equipment for such probes can be uh, quite expensive. Well, probably I should speak a bit louder or slower. And uh, there is also the issue of connection. You know that satellites are used for it and and uh, stratosphere platforms for the internet for improving connection for signal retranslation are used now. These are applied spheres and there is also a research sphere that is to use it is to learn how to control these devices that move with the wind. So it's possible to manage this issue partially when we use flows in the atmosphere of the Earth, and it is already practiced. Such aero states exist. They can move from one flow to another flow will change the height. And, uh, you know, there was a specific program. Google actually used it. So Google company developed a software to deliver the internet in very remote places, somewhere in Africa or in Latin America. And uh, there is a specificity, a specificity of using all these devices. In principle, it is also connected to the fact that these devices should function in conditions of uncertainty, because their position in the air is not certain. And quite a lot of such air states have been launched. How many? What task was fulfilled? How long did it last? Uh, this program lasted, I don't know, less than 10 years. So that was one decade. And I guess that the record was one year. So this atmosphere satellite uh, did not need refueling, only the stock that it had. And we also set the task to ourselves, first of all, to provide for long-term functioning of air states so that uh, in future we would be able to provide for long-term functioning of airships. At this height, we have quite uh, high plans regarding dirigibles, not 10 days, uh, but even more, much more, that they should be able to function in stratosphere. So, we need to solve all these issues, uh, test the equipment that we need for connection, and we're planning to do all of that. I guess that I would like to say that what kind of conditions exist in stratosphere? Well, yes, but I guess that at first I would like to comment on it. Last time we mentioned that stratosphere, the first stratosphere device will be lifted in six or in seven years. Uh, 
that was about a big zero stratosphere platform that Mr. Sugevich wants to develop based on dirigibles. It will be able to raise quite a lot of equipment, it will be batch production, and uh, here it all will be started with small devices that uh, by the end of this summer, most likely, we uh, will already launch and we will work with all the things that uh, will be included in the development of uh, these airship so the nearest launch will happen really soon and this information is cool and speaking about the stratosphere balloons so you are saying that we need to catch the airflow so this balloon will go up after that it will go down and uh, you know it's quite similar to answer to the question how will dirigible go up and down so what about the technology is it quite similar or not let's divide these technologies so that people will perceive the information appropriately so there are some things that uh, for me are quite obvious but i would like to share this information with you speaking about winds airflows where this airship will function in stratosphere and uh, common air states are based on the same principles. The specificity is that the air around the Earth moves all the time around the Earth in a circle, and uh, there are flows that go to the middle of the Earth with some deviations at small height, so there is less turbulence in terms of air flows there are fewer virus, everything is quite stable. So there is an airflow, it uh, uh, goes in a stable manner. And all of them go from the west to the east, these winds in our zone up to specific height. And there is also a counter flow where the wind goes in the opposite direction from east to west and there are two such wheels so you can open at this altitude and you can see that there is a powerful flow around the earth so this central point is the um, fastest speed of the flow this is a different speed and this is a different direction yes this is a different direction and this flow is shifted i mean that in winter so this is summer and this is so this is summer and this is winter i mean that in winter this a flow so the flow uh, to the east uh, is in Greece, it covers almost the whole northern hemisphere to the highest altitudes, and a uh, counter flow from the south goes to all places, and top part of stratosphere starts moving in the opposite direction. Uh, that's why the solutions that we're developing, that other experts are developing, that is uh, to uh, develop an installation that would use solar energy and provide for continuous control of this airship so that it will not be moved with the wind and uh, currently you know uh, it's at the edge of our technical capabilities and it requires quite a lot of investments that is developed by China and some other countries. So there are such startups that are trying to do that. But as a whole, uh, currently we have an understanding that in the beginning, we need uh, to uh, start managing, controlling these devices in a small range. For example, uh, when we move from one flow to another flow, it can go in circle. And in that case, we can launch several such devices to the clouds and we will be able to continuously provide uh, for the SD at height and uh, tra transfer the internet, for example. But initially, we need to confirm that this is possible, what kind of control we can achieve at first when we just change the altitude and we know that uh, such 
air stage when they change the altitude all the time are able uh, to stay still in the area of 100 or 200 kilometers so the height is quite small and the zone of coverage of the internet is quite big so it can be up to 500 kilometers and more and uh, we can resolve these issues but this counter flows as i already explained quite frequently can be used in uh, tropical latitudes and there are quite a lot of countries that need it uh, they also contacted aerostatica company to discuss it because the interest to uh, such platforms is quite high in the world and one solution that can also be considered is an intermediary option when uh, an air state can be controlled not only in terms of height but it can also go horizontally and it has specific uh, propellers for it and i didn't mention that when we want to control the height of this air state we can use this form of control for airships as well and uh, there are specific principles that we wanted to study at air state first we want to teach them how to change uh, their height or status specific height uh, specific altitude and after that we will uh, try to control them in horizontal uh, area so that we would use as small energy as possible and make them hover for a long time and when we develop a full-fledged airship it will have uh, some spare fuel and if we use winds appropriately it will be able to stay at these altitudes longer and uh, well you know i can actually continue well, it means that this kind of device, you are saying that uh, many people are trying to develop them. This is a stratosphere probe that can hover above specific area and it fulfills the function of geostational satellite. Well, actually, yes. Well, I cannot say that it is globally uh, developed now, but there are several companies that do that. I mentioned one of them. This is Google Moon, yes, and have they finished this program? And uh, why did they finish it? Well, there are several more companies that use such technologies and provide for transition of air states from one height to another. And why was this project finished? Because they fulfilled their mission, or is there any reason for it? Well, they fulfilled the tasks that they set to themselves, but taking into account the competition of, with satellites, this program was finished. So, as a whole, we can say that it was finished because quite a lot of investments were required and they provided for they actually provided for coverage in these places but still the stratosphere platform is really interesting and i, I can explain well yes please because we want to understand that because uh, we can see the demand is growing because every delivery of a satellite is related with a lot of footprints in the atmosphere uh, and uh, a rocket carrier is needed, a lot of money should be spent. And uh, when we speak about uh, strata states, uh, you know, they do not require quite a lot of funds, and it's, it's quite easy and fast. And these are not only strata states that are always launched in the atmosphere, atmosphere probes, meteor probes are, are launched all the time for educational purposes as well, uh, to conduct tests at these heights, uh, tests of upsets. These are microsatellites that are getting really popular uh, because now uh, 
uh, chips are used, they're really small, and a huge satellite is not needed. And of uh, these uh, cops, copsats are sent to the space for some purposes, but a rocket is needed to send them there. Well, yes, uh, this is an atmosphere satellite based on stratostate, and uh, it uh, it has a low height orbit. It goes around the Earth with the airflow, but it is not widely used in the world because there is uh, no legal base for it. Although, when we speak about stratosphere, there is an airspace zone, and for example, somewhere in the south southern hemisphere, it's possible to do that. In the northern hemisphere, well, we need to resolve such issues, but at first, we should provide for the existence of such platforms, develop them, and and after that, we can solve other issues so that people wouldn't be afraid that uh, these uh, balloons can be dangerous. And actually, taking into account that Russia has quite a lot of territory and stratostates that are launched can actually go along the territory of the country within several days and they would still remain in our air space and in future it's possible to agree with some countries to get permits and further said that there is an analogy with common airships so it's possible to uh, control height, the principle is quite similar for airships, for better states, these principles can be quite similar, and this air rivers that flow starting in the altitude of approximately five, six or seven kilometers that are quite stable, although, of course, they're most stable in stratosphere. And stratosphere is the zone where temperature uh, stops getting down. I mean that the air gets cooler, and after that, the temperature doesn't change. So it can be eight to seven on the poles and uh, fourteen. Putin at the equator, that is the height. And you know, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, he said that we can go around the Earth. He said that a, a satellite can go around the Earth. And he is one of the first people that actually explained that it is possible. And he also said that dirigibles are possible. He was quite convinced that these airships can become transport of the future. And I guess that there are a very good quote. If even if you make an airship of silver or gold, it will still be profitable. And all of that was said in the time of a Russian Tsar and the logistics was not always good, but we see that dirigible is economically profitable for many tasks, and people are interested in more down-to-earth issues. So, this, they are asking, and where does dust finish? Okay, speaking about Selkovsky, he actually proposed that, supposed that airships can go up and uh, transfer with these air rivers from east to west and transport cargo. So he said that it's possible to launch a dirigible on the orbit, but it's quite difficult to make these dreams come true because, uh, first of all, we need to uh, develop a vehicle that can transport cargo, and secondly, it should go to the to this high altitude. So this should be quite a big device. And now we want to make a good and controllable airship. 
uh, that does not uh, depend, that can actually fight air flows. And after that, we can use it, taking into account these air currents in the atmosphere. And uh, mostly it's not about dust, it's about clouds, about thunderstorms in the atmosphere. The uh, biggest towers of thunder clouds are before the stratosphere begins. So that is approximately 10 or 12 kilometers, but as a whole, it is much lower. So these can be two or three kilometers. In, actually, you have used aircraft, you know, that is possible to go this height and the sun is visible there and there are no shadows. Only very high clouds, but at the height of 10 kilometers, there is there are no clouds at all. And quite a lot of sunlight. So it's quite similar in terms of its characteristics to the spectrum and to the flow that goes from space to Earth. And speaking about dust, in principle, I can see that dust can be found everywhere. There is even dust that can be found in stratosphere because when the particles are small, they uh, can actually go down really slowly from stratosphere. And uh, how does it get there? This dust is lifted due to various processes. And first of all, some disasters. So in case there are some big eruptions and particles go up as the result of some powerful explosions and very small amount of dust comes to us from space and it burns almost straight away and as a whole we don't actually notice that dust or microorganisms that are present everywhere, including the stratosphere, we almost do not see them, do not notice them. And it doesn't have any impact, but in case this clouds of powder go up or in the stratosphere, it's possible that the climate would change, would become colder that happened after powerful eruptions of volcanoes, but I guess that we got distracted quite a lot. So yes, we have started speaking about stratosphere because indeed it's really interesting. And actually, as Sergei Simonov could say, uh, all uh, people that believe that the land is flat are waiting when we lift the camera so that we could check if land is flat or not. Indeed, we will raise a camera to show it to everyone to see it by ourselves to solve various tasks and all of that will happen very soon so give us likes if you want to see uh, the earth from the top from the stratosphere device that uh, had has been produced by our company well yeah so we can go and see the edge of the the earth uh, to see uh, what it looks like and for this purpose, we need to apply specific technologies that we are developing now. Namely, we should provide for height stabilization, for stabilization of the height of this balloon. And uh, we received a question about the shape of this balloon. Can this balloon change its shape? And actually, it changes its shape uh, when it left the Earth. Well, uh, and everyone, I guess, could see that that it looks like that, approximately. So it is like that in the beginning. After that, it goes up, and it is at height, and the atmosphere is different there. So it's so the pressure makes this balloon look like that. Yes, and uh, when it is completely filled, it uh, goes. To a different altitude and 
extra gas leaves it. So it moves with several meters per second. It reaches this height and it reaches equilibrium or well, its equilibrium can be changed because of heating and heating occurs when the temperature of earth influences it and as a result of that the volume increases and decreases and when uh, some gas is lost it's necessary uh, to uh, let some cargo fall so that a dirigible uh, debulks and uh, all, uh, our airships have a bulk system and there are also specific bulks that are used for loading dirigibles well, Yes, we have received a question about this uh, ballast system. What kind of ballast system will be used? Yes, I will share some information with it. It's not scary at all. So, when an airship is used at land or in the sky, it cannot be too light, otherwise it will fly away. So uh, there should be some ballast, and for this purpose, specific sacks are used, and uh, larger systems use more complicated ballast system, and there is also liquid ballast. And ballast in the form of small powder, and it was proven uh, by uh, the first series developers that went from the earth on stress state that uh, small powder even made of lead uh, is not harmful even if it gets to stratosphere so there are specific features here but of course everyone is saying that ballast is not a uh, convenient it's like uh, the previous century. Could you please explain why it's not the previous century? Are there any alternative solutions? Or we need ballast, but together with all the technologies? Well, yes, I will explain our approach. Of course, as a whole, well, my colleagues, including Alexander Nikolaevich and me, we think that airships should be should have very powerful engines, it should have uh, very efficient propellers so that they would have very good technical characteristics and these propellers can be turned up when an airship goes up and thus a part of the cargo can be lifted with propellers and during the flight these propellers are turned and uh, the traction changes and this small cargo uh, that is quite small compared with the total mass of a dirigible so in a classical situation that is 10 percent and if it is more this is a hybrid device and it can uh, lift it can actually use aerodynamic forces uh, to balance up to half of its weight. A common uh, airship without wings, without specific aerodynamics, at the speed of 100 kilometers per hour, and we would like uh, to go with the speed of 150 kilometers per hour and more, if you've noticed that is stated in the technical characteristics that we mentioned, and it's quite easy to create all the necessary forces so that uh, the cargo that is lifted with propellers can go up so that it would be possible to balance it with aerodynamic force. So you mean that a dirigible flies not parallel to the land, but there is a small angle, small slope, but thus a lifting force is created thanks to aerodynamics. Yes, you're right. And uh, there are 
a specific features here that we need to take into account. So the angle should be appropriate in flight. And, you know, there are two approaches here. So uh, we can take uh, the whole fuel with propellers, or we can also take the whole cargo with propellers. And in that case, we need to have very powerful installations. But in that case, why do we need an airship if all the cargo is lifted by propellers? Indeed. So in this case, we cannot save much money if we uh, consume these capacities completely. But actually, there is an optimum speed uh, for these dirigibles above 120 kilometers per hour, maybe 140 kilometers per hour, especially when we speak about big airships. So this is cruising speed. And uh, the energy consumption of an airship decreases a lot when its size increases and the uh, lifting power goes down. But still, it is enough for big devices. That's why speaking about airships, of course, we should uh, find a balance between a very good parameters of of uh, propellers and motors with big propellers or with a good utility quotients that will operate at a high speed and when it goes up uh, and uh, it will be controllable uh, to, and will be possible to lift uh, the weight of cargo, the weight of fuel, and secondly, part of the cargo that can be balanced by aerostatic lift force of gas or aerodynamics. And so the issue of ballast can be resolved. In principle, uh, this is an energy efficient technology. If we do not want to spend extra fuel uh, to create everything with aerodynamic forces, we can allow ourselves to have such a volume of this airship that will balance part of the cargo that we cannot lift with propellers. And for small devices, it is quite appropriate uh, to lift cargo with propellers. So all these issues will be resolved. And we will continuously study the technology of uh, changing the floating effect. I mean, the buoyancy, buoyancy that changes when the volume of gas in a balloon changes at the same height. And it can be achieved by various means. Well, the most classical way is heating gas. And it's not very convenient when the flight is long. It will require quite a lot of cards for heat insulation and very productive heat exchange. This issue has already been discussed in the chat. And actually, heat airships, well, well were developed by my colleagues. I helped them a bit. And uh, they can float quite fast because as a result of this heat exchange, the cover becomes colder. Normally, when you go by car, you put your hand outside the window and you feel cold very fast. The same is true about dirigible. If it moves fast, it loses uh, heat quite fast. And uh, many people ask me, well, why not a heat dirigible? Why vacuum you know, dirigibles? So the answer is simple, because uh, it gets cooler when it flies. And at the same time, this heating can be used uh, during takeoff, for example, for a brief time when, well, it is possible. And after that, in flight, during flight, it gets cooler. And we can do 
we can use our dynamic forces for this load. And uh, during landing, we will need to heat the gas inside uh, this uh, coating. We do not want to disclose the ready solution and our calculations. And in the world, well, actually, that is what I did. I mean that we speak not only about our solutions, but also possible solutions, because these issues are always important. Sure. Can you hear me normally? Yes. So, one of these technologies is uh, to construct gas. So, the helium is inside its coating, and after that, we took 100 cubometers of helium, so the buoyancy decreased. Uh, we can uh, we can uh, remove 100 kilos and the weight will be the same. It seems that it's really difficult, but actually it's possible. So uh, to decrease the costs, not to use 300 atmosphere pressure or more, we actually thought that it's possible to use uh, very strong sacks that uh, can uh, cope with uh, pressure gap, use helium for it, and it can change the buoyancy. And uh, several companies in the world are considering these systems. Uh, this is physics. It's quite clear. But what about the strength of these coatings, the safety, the weight of these coatings? After the studies, we came to the conclusion that it's too early to use these principles. So you mean that there is specific volume in the sack, and we need to compress this sack so that this volume would leave it. Well, yes, I mean that we do not compress the coating of this airship itself. It's quite rigid because it's complicated. It's complicated to compress oh, the whole coating. Selkovsky proposed it, but he proposed to make metal coating that uh, would be compressed, but he also proposed not to compress uh, and uh, increase the volume, but to use heating and cooling to change the volume, because otherwise it will be quite, it actually, it's quite complicated. And at the same time, when we speak about air stage, Sometimes this technology works when we want to change the volume of uh, a coating a bit. And for dirigibles, we decided to uh, move uh, gas to a specific volume. And uh, I do not want to dwell upon that. I just want to say that we're not moving to this direction because there are some issues related to security. Uh, weight efficiency of these systems. So the efficiency will be worse than in case of engines. I mean that to load it with these balloons and compressors, well, it is then, then doing that, it's, part, it's easier to use additional propellers to solve all the issues with propellers. Yes, uh, as I actually asked this question, why do we need dirigible if we can use propellers? And the answer is safety. First, if our propellers are off, everything falls, but if propellers are switched off, but this airship exists, nothing fell. It continues flowing. It's like a question, why do we need a yacht if there is a yacht engine? Well, yes, it's a very important issue. What do we want to achieve with the dirigibles and what is our advantage? And this is the advantage. This is free lift force of aerostatic gas. And now it's possible to move to the issue of gas. What kind of floating gases can be used? We know that there is hydrogen and helium, but these are the lightest gases. One of them weighs 85 grams per cubic meter, the second one uh, 75. Well, um, it can be up to 200, dependent on pollution. I mean, helium. And uh, there is also, there are also gases that are less efficient, but uh, they can also give quite good aerostatic force. This is methane. 
and others. Ammonia, for example, and their weight is approximately uh, 770 grams or uh, metan, and all the rest is a lifting force that is approximately 0.5 kilos. So uh, what about helium and hydrogen so that it would be clear? So you mean that a methane can lift a, a, a kilo per cubic meter and helium approximately one kilo. And what about hydrogen? Uh, 85 grams more. So the difference between hydrogen and helium is not significant. The difference between helium or ammonia and methane is significant. Well, yes. Yes, I mean, hydrogen is twice lighter than helium, 85 grams, 170 grams, more than 180 grams. It's not a big difference. Another thing is cost, but the cost of helium can be well balanced by the market, the exploration, the need of it, and of course, alternative solutions can exist with the use of hydrogen phlegmatization, but now we are focused on maximum safety helium, I mean. And speaking about other gases, sometimes in they used they were used in aerostatics as well. I mean gas balloons. When motors uh, used gas in sacks, if, for example, it was a mix of methane and propane, so uh, there was so-called gas that is equal to air in its weight. So if we burn one a tone of a kerosene, a dirigible becomes a one tone lighter. So uh, dirigibles are good, could discharge hydrogen. That is what Heldenburg did. And there are some issues here, some risks here, because uh, it's bad for fire safety. So there is a theory that Hildenburg's disaster was related only to hydrogen, but also to gas fuel that was in this shell. Because actually this is a combustible gas, methane, propane, butane, it can explode. And at the same time, this technology is quite safe. It can also be used. But we will not reveal all the secrets and all the opportunities. And there are other ways how to change buoyancy. Chemical generation. For example, phase transition. For example, water. So you meant cry a dirigible. No, this is not cry airship. That's uh, the other way around. That's related to heating. Helium will not uh, be cooled for sure. I mean, that we could use a pump there. Why not? So it will fly, it will be cold, and we're saying that we are having global warming, so they will cool the atmosphere. Well, I can think it over. Okay. So there will be more snow, we'll have to fight this snow. Uh, okay, more questions to ask. I guess that everything is clear about the ballast, that it will exist, but there are other technical solutions that will be applied together with ballast, so ballast can be the main one or an additional one because uh, the tasks are different and different types and dimensions of dirigibles are used for different tasks and it can be different for different tasks. A ballast is not the previous century. 
it's like uh, wheels of a car they should exist we have not seen flying cars yet so the shape of balloons it's quite clear alexander gin is asking what is the power he also asked about generator uh, different heights different uh, depending on uh, the direction of wind well actually speaking about engines we have agreed upon these issues more than three years ago with ours so we remember what kind of characteristics we have we selected specific propeller modes and this motor has power for approximately 500 horsepowers Well, there is a brief diff small difference there. And even today, uh, this engine has quite powerful generator. It is hybrid. And we will also test how it works in our conditions. And normally, the motors that are used for dirigibles are simpler than the ones that are used for an aircraft, because for an aircraft, it's important to always have an opportunity to add some gas. And here we can feel quite comfortable, because as a whole, The issues of safe landing can be solved. I mean that if this engine doesn't work, probably this dirigible will not even need or to debulk. It will just go down slowly. And we think that we would use electric motors and accumulators on board they will provide very comfortable control of landing. I mean that uh, there will be no rejections because uh, this motor is very reliable. It has been tested. It has been tested in uh, Arab Emirates, no, very with difficult temperature conditions. One of my friends calculated the temperature mode And all of this was done at a very high level. And we think that the kind of motor that we will use will be really helpful. It will provide for the necessary speed and all other characteristics of airship. So there is a car engine, and it works when a car Oh, stay still. So it it is still. But what about an aircraft? When it switched on its turbine, the engine breaks all the time. And aircraft engine is different from car engine because uh, the materials should be more reliable, should be stronger, uh, more durable. They should be much better in terms of design and structure, much safer than car engine. But speaking about dirigible, we can actually relax a bit. As it was explained to me, it's possible to take a modernized car motor that is more suitable for aviation, but it should have some spare capacity. It should not be used completely. It should be used in a sparing mode. And in that case, everything will be quite well. That's why, as I understand, our motor uh, can be used. In this way, yes, sure. Uh, this engine is quite promising. And on its basis, uh, we uh, will develop full fledged aviation motors. And as I understand, official research has already started. 
So this is the matter of consumers. If we have consumers, all the issues can be resolved. This is an electric motor. And uh, when Dmitry Dunov attended Army 2024, he saw Slavyanka Dmitry Sergeyevich. It is probable that these uh, dirigible motors will use Slavyanka technology. Well, it happened so. Uh, when I entered, uh, I saw further and the team, and they invited me to see Sovelmash machines. So I was accompanied there. I met the team. I saw the solutions of aviation type meet on the basis of Slavyanka technology. Uh, there is a very powerful device there with specific propellers. And the characteristics of this motor uh, actually made me really interested. As a whole, we have agreed that Anyway, we give them our specification and uh, they will see it and say what kind of motor they can provide to us. Specific power, and they will specify the weight, the time of development. And uh, we can see that uh, this technology can be applied. We can contact them again, discuss more details, because uh, there are some issues of regulating the uh, rounds per minute of Slavyanka motor. And they're interesting for us because the use of alternating current can uh, allow us more efficient cycle because a continuous uh, current at high power is more expensive. So indeed, the development of electric motors without uh, continuous magnets uh, can disseminate a lot because magnets are difficult, expensive, are made of expensive metals. And I do not want to dwell upon their characteristics. I can just say that their characteristics are quite close to uh, Slavyanka electric motors. And when we speak about magnets, so the structure is simpler. There are no specific cooling systems. Uh, Dmitry Sergeyevich, and when you wanted to attend this army exhibition, you actually had different goals. Could you please briefly describe? Well, actually, you know, I attended this exhibition last time. It was also quite important for me. So there is a place where I speak about aerostatic devices, how useful they are, what can be done. So I attended this arm exhibition three or four times, and this time this exhibition was smaller. There was also a number of business meetings devoted to this subject. OK, let's continue. Is dirigible afraid of thunders and lightnings? I guess that we discussed it a bit. And could you please discuss it more? Because this airship is big, and it's quite easy for a lightning to reach it than an aircraft. Well, just like any device, it is susceptible to atmosphere electricity. And all these devices, all these devices should be tested and tried to the specific polygon where they tested. And we were there. We even lifted an air state on this polygon. And in our case, 
mostly this question stems from the fact that when a charge, an electric charge, reaches specific material it's necessary uh, to provide uh, for an opportunity to, to dissolve around the shell. And on the other hand, the experience has shown us that, in principle, uh, this airship should not fly when there is thunderstorm. It should go down, people should leave it, uh, because even at land it's possible that an electric charge gets into it. And the issues of accumulating electrostatic charge for airships are more essential because the surface is really big and when it passes through that atmosphere, humid atmosphere, electrostatic energy can accumulate there and it can result in internal charges. But all these issues can be resolved. So we know it. We know how to solve it. So everything is known and nothing will happen to it right. Uh, specific equipment is installed there and they have specific needles where the charge is accumulated. So there is a stacker there and uh, we do not want this airship to charge, that's why specific stacker is used. And uh, what if a lighting lightning hits it. Well, of course, it does not protect it from a lightning, it protects it from excessive accumulation of charge for every aircraft. Every aircraft has such elements, so-called stackers. And we touched upon these issues when we were developing air state sets uh, there is a specific uh, system there. And the dirigible is in air. Just like any flying vehicle, for any flying vehicle, it's possible that a lightning can hit it. And that's why it's better not to fly when there is a thunderstorm. Well, yes, when a lightning hits something, it's not desirable for any type of vehicle. Another good question that is interesting for many people. Will it be difficult to use an airship in, if winter lasts long, for example, when we speak about a north or west of Siberia, Magadan, because of airships are really needed there. Indeed, this is a serious question, and there are two aspects here. On the one and Alexander Nikolaevich has a number of new house, how to remove snow if it is present on the shell. So there are some ways where heat is used and other ways, and you will see when we have it, you will see it. But of course, one of such cases when we test this shell, how strong it is, we use the load with snow. I mean that we cannot be protected from snow, but there can be quite a lot of snow, and uh, the shell should be strong enough to bear it. And this load on shell is comparable to the one that can be encountered during flight. So uh, we calculate the layer of snow. Specific level is accumulated, and after that it falls from the shell, and it is considered that there should be specific calculation for this load, and all these issues are resolved when we design an airship. Actually, we have already solved them for various types of airships. I mean that the issue of use has been solved. And what about oil lobby? It still exists. Oh, will oil lobby 
let this project live? I didn't quite understand the, this question. So probably there are some authorities that are against. Well, I guess that the most difficulty is, the biggest difficulty is that many people are not used to dirigibles. They have not seen airships and they think that they will not exist in future. This is inertia of thinking and it exists. And at the same time, I actually talked to people that saw airships. And even today we can we could see them. And it's you know it's very different from aircraft testing. So it came there and it flies. There is no problem there at all. Well, there are no apprehensions, no concerns that something can happen. And Normally, for the first test, best weather conditions are selected. And uh, when we speak about more complicated conditions or difficult conditions, oh, we also solve this task so that these airships could be used just like other aircrafts. And aircraft also have their limitations for meteor conditions. You know, I once stayed two days in Sochi airport when the weather, till the weather improved because no one could fly in this weather and airships uh, are not actually, are not different here either. And uh, this kind of airship will be very modern. It will be possible to use it every day in sunny weather, windy weather, snowing weather. This is a contemporary airship. And the airships that were used before were not able to do that. And uh, there is another question here. What is the gas pressure for an airship? Is it uh, below or above the atmosphere pressure? How much can we decrease the pressure with vacuum, for example? Do you consider uh, methane condensation in cold conditions? Well, speaking about pressure, that is interesting. Well, look here. In the past, the airship uh, did not have such good materials as we have now. Uh, pressure was not very high, approximately 500 pascals, for example, or 50 millimeters of water. And now, uh, and uh, that is 100. So it means that 100 kilos per square meter. This is the pressure that provides a very rigid shell that can maintain quite high loads. That is one hundredth of atmosphere pressure, am I right? And if we uh, blow one hundredth of pressure into dirigible into an airship, it will be rigid. Yes, it will be rigid. And this is the pressure inside. And actually, we can increase this pressure, but uh, we do not want to load the material. And uh, that is true about our airship. And uh, the shell has such a shape uh, because it has inflatable structure. And if this is a big airship, the ones that were used in the beginning of the previous century, uh, they used a rigid scheme and inside them the gas pressure was very small because uh, their shape was maintained by a rigid frame. And uh, this is one of the advantages because, of course, making a soft uh, airship with a very big shell, for example, 100,000 cubic meters or more, uh, it's very difficult. And the main thing is that it's not reliable. I mean, that if something happens, soft fabric, uh, you know, uh, the spare strength, strengthness is bigger. And if this airship is rigid, all these issues are solved. And 
this shell is not loaded by inner pressure. Only the pressure that emerges at high speed because there is pressure inside. So it is possible to apply a lighter shell from lighter materials. And helium is in internal sections, in sacks. It is in sacks, and these sacks through the shell on which they are based uh, transfer their powers. This is a classical structure for saplings and other rigid dirigibles. Suspensions are used there. So, in a rigid airship, pressure in sex is equal to atmosphere pressure. Because on top, the pressure is higher, so there is pressure gradient. And once again, there is a question. One hundredth of atmosphere pressure and the dirigible can fly, or when the sack is not completely inflated and the pressure is atmosphere pressure. So it means that the, the pressure in atmosphere is not equal to atmosphere pressure. No, I mean that if uh, this is a rigid uh, airship, uh, the sacks are not completely inflated. Uh, so this is like an air state and it is in a rigid shell. And there is another issue, probably not everyone is aware of that. Pressure uh, gets less with height and the volume of gas gets bigger proportionally to the pressure and the shell of an airship uh, has a specific shape and this shape remains. And how is it, why is it provided? Because the helium volume of an airship increases at height and the shell remains the same because there are air sacs and there is an air and gas system that pumps air there so that the sac would always uh, remain the same. For example, if it gets down, the pressure in the shell gets down and a beam add some gas there and uh, this is solved by pneumatic systems for a soft dirigible and for a rigid airship all of that is not needed because its sections are at a small height are uh, filled with helium by one half or two thirds and at a big height uh, they are extant and they are almost completely filled with helium and there is always some spare volume so that it's possible to get extended and helium will not leave these sacks. And uh, this is the most basic information. Of course, I need to prepare a presentation about it, where all of that uh, will be demonstrated. And there would be some animation so that everyone will be able to see it. That it works really well and interesting. It, it, it used to work, it will work in future as well. Besides, uh, there is also an opportunity so if there are sacks, of course, uh, it is more reliable because if something happens with one sack, all other sacks will remain. I mean that uh, it's uh, like a submarine. And secondly, this is an opportunity to repump from one sack to another to change uh, the balancing in flight. It's always very useful to balance an airship, to decrease the balancing loss, to decrease the effort at the steering wheel. So there are some issues here. And speaking about vacuum airships, I guess that uh, we uh, will we decrease the pressure in the shell. No, we're not planning to decrease pressure in the shell. And all calculations have shown that at a contemporary level, vacuum airship will get drowned in water. I mean that uh, if this is an airship with vacuum inside, but the shell would be so heavy that it will get uh, drowned, it will sink sink in water it will not go up and there are quite a lot of videos of when it's not even vacuum but uh this is a barrel or a cistern and uh, it uh, was cooled a bit 
and vacuum can break it. I mean that uh, even the frame can be banded. So uh, the power of compression is quite big, and for this uh, vacuum airship, you know, it, it will not be able to fly. There are no such materials, no such technologies. And we don't really need it, because we have quite good and light gases that can solve these issues. Another thing is that, in principle, we're quite open to new technologies, new technical solutions. And we selected quite a classical concept of airship that, at the same time, uh, should provide for reliable development of airships and the development of the company. That's right. So we start it in a classical manner, and actually, uh, there are quite a lot of crazy ideas here. And in future, uh, we will consider all of them, probably even implement them. So uh, um, this can be stratosphere dirigible with specific kind of motors. It's really interesting. But we're starting with something that is possible to do here and now. Experiments will be in parallel, of course. But we're starting in the classical manner. And after that, we will do something else. Well, I can say that in a dirigible, when you fly, you feel much better as if you're in a boat or a yacht, open water, uh, no vibration, no, no noise, uh, and everything is much softer, much more comfortable. And indeed, you feel safe because you go by aircraft, you do not always feel safe. Helicopter, the same. And when you're in a dirigible, it's as if you are on a balcony. Well, of course, when you speak about dirigibles, it's much more comfortable. So there is a feeling that it is reliable. And when you can see that it is controllable, you know, it's very interesting to observe the flight because it's very different from aircraft. The speed is quite big. The height is quite small, probably 80 or 100 kilometers per hour. And it is big, that's why the dynamics, you know, it looks very dynamic, actually, when you observe it. And you feel calm. And actually, everything is very smooth and And it can be stable in terms of flat, of height. I mean, of course, it can lose its equilibrium, and it can be managed to go left, go right, and in terms of height, it's also possible to control it, and it's quite easy to control it. I mean, that it's very different from cars, when you always have to look left and right here, you have some space in the air open space. Of course, control and dirigible requires specific skills, but in my opinion, it is easier than controlling an aircraft. Right. So the question is, uh, when will the first dirigible fly? Well, uh, we have a plan. I do not want to develop on it now. Well, you can mention it now. Why? I mean, we mentioned that according to most pessimistic evaluation in 3.5 years, our CUOT, its trial form, uh, will actually a fly. I, I think that it will happen even before this is uh, the uh, most pessimistic scenario. Well, when will we fly? Ours will fly much sooner. Well, I'm just judging by my experience. We received uh, orders for dirigibles in the company where I worked with two seats, with ten seats, and without that, well, it's second year in a row. It takes such a lot of time. 
and on the year three it, al it already flew and now i'm remembering you know thousands of years have passed maybe 10 years 20 years have passed and i remember that actually these periods are really short it's like one day when we created it it, it was the feeling because actually uh, there's quite a lot of work quite a lot of events that we experience and uh, just as I said, you go to the field and it goes up and it flies. Well, indeed, and there is such a feeling that we started today and uh, we uh, flew three years later and nothing will happen. Actually, we don't need to wait because we'll start with stratosphere balloons and already have guys in the bomb, bomb University, Arcadi, that is the hope, the future of a global uh, dirigible construction, a very talented guy that can already fly on a small device with electric motors. We will make you meet him, of course. And uh, such small areas will develop and we will also uh, widely speak about, speak a lot about uh, development, templates, preliminary tests, alien construction. Indeed, we have quite a lot of cool events and we uh, will monitor all of them it will not be closed we are ready to show everything all our developments uh, we will share all information with you that's why Mr. Sergeyevich is right when you are submitted when you are submerged in the process it all moves really fast and I hope that we uh, will uh, make you submerge into this process we will film every minute it will be quite similar to a TV series to show complete atmosphere and everything that's going on so that it will be clear to everyone and you know nowadays we're all experts in dirigible construction so uh, could you give us a virtual tour on an airship that is easy Mr. Sergeyevich has it already I can send you a link if you have VR glasses you can test them or you can just use your phone looking inside the cabin so indeed we can send you a link the tour is ready and actually there are quite a lot of things that are ready now a simulator and yes yes we've developed it and we're developing more such tours so that it can be quite interesting it's quite different from aircraft For example, uh, going vertically upwards. The weight of an airship is small, the traction of motors is enough. And on a real one, it's not possible to do it because uh, the uh, load on the shell would be too much. And it's possible to design it in such a manner that it will go vertically. We did not set such task yet. Well, it can fly using ballistic trajectory. As I understand, an airship wants to stay like that. Because this is the most energy efficient position. And sometimes it happens that uh, when you park a dirigible, uh, the wind blows, the tail goes up, and after that it goes down. And uh, there were such emergencies that inside helium uh, redistributed in this airship and it uh, moved in in the vertical form and uh, the impact of wind is quite significant that's why for big airships uh, we will consider everything for it uh, not for it to stay in horizontal position well there are quite a lot of questions about the useful space. It seems that the useful space is so small and this uh, lifting frame is huge. And what is the ratio? Is it useful? Why do we need this big structure? And uh, I can actually speak about my uh, inner sensation when I first saw this dirigible. That was my first question. Such a small uh, cabin, such a big balloon. Why is it like that? 
And actually, when you enter this inner space, you do not uh, feel that there is such a big balloon above you. Everything is very comfortable. And uh, you just look outside the window and uh, you cannot see the balloon. So you do not care about it because uh, you uh, can see quite a uh, big room around you. You feel safe. And actually, this question always is frequently asked. And uh, when I started my work, you know, I somehow got used to it. So there is a feeling that, yes, it is big, but it can uh, lift a lot of cargo, the cabin as well. And uh, this is just a shape. We need to get used to uh, the architecture of dirigibles and use it. So uh, this big space uh, can be used. I mean that it's possible to uh, locate premises, it's possible to use its all its whole space and actually uh, that uh, that was done with big airships yes uh, so there are different structures there it seems uh, that uh, the structure below is useless but actually there is a room with windows a flying palace so i guess that uh, i have seen all the questions in vk alexander manjul is asking how much will our CO cost? Uh, speaking about business plan and self cost, uh, it will be like a couple of new Rolls Royces and selling price. No, well, it depends on whom you sell it. You should save more money. Well, I'm just thinking, how long have we been on here? An hour and a half? almost two hours well we were late a bit and the sound didn't work so probably we can also spend 10 more minutes to the to other technical questions uh, that were asked in the very beginning you can actually check there are some technical questions here as well probably some of them are interesting because uh, we have quite a lot of questions and we lack expert opinion okay i've opened youtube what is the power of electric motor? Well, it is different for different devices. There are lots of electric motors. Uh, they are everywhere. And uh, motor wheels, flywheel motor wheels are enough for the first dirigibles. We don't know how many yet, the thickness of the package, but we know that we can use them. How it goes up, we know what do we need for it to go down. Uh, how to land. I guess that we have answered this question. I can briefly answer it again. Well, look here. As a whole, dirigibles are quite heavy. That's why they go down by themselves. But they are also controlled. And, and uh, so to go down, or we just uh, go with our nose, turn the nose of airship down, if we want to go up, we turn the nose up. And uh, if there is cargo, we can lift the cargo. And uh, this device is very light because most part of the weight is balanced by aerostatic force. I think that the answer was given. And, uh, you know, every day I learn more about airships. And I understand if it doesn't actually weight anything, uh, you push it and it flies in this direction at a mid reset of you turn it downwards, it goes down. You turn it up, it goes up. You stopped, it hovers. And uh, yes, it's even possible to go down uh, with the access of aerostatic force. But as a whole, uh, we are speaking about airships that are heavier than air. And when it hovers, it just goes down slowly. And there is another question about revenue. When uh, do you plan to start the commissioning? Right after the certification of the first divorce. So we have one year for certification. 
and it means that in four years or before we will get revenue from operation and all more exact numbers will be demonstrated later speaking about revenue we've calculated it approximately for a small series of 12 hours yachts and 15 uh, 10 ton airships per year uh, and it was well not revenue but net profit uh, 300 something million dollars and uh, we were quite modest in our calculations per year and uh, from uh, these numbers we took our capitalization one billion everyone likes taking that profit you multiply it by three and this is capitalization of the company and we're saying that this is a very modest calculation and the profit i mean the dividend profit can be received even before operation we also mentioned that more than once within the first year or two uh, even when the dirigible doesn't fly yet, all big investors and customers will understand that we're quite serious. They will understand that industrial institutions uh, are engaged, airlines are being constructed, dirigibles are being designed, and we understand everything about the risks so that uh, they can address us with an order to develop uh, something specific to fulfill specific tasks or uh, specific commercial tasks. And uh, when uh, we pay for the development of this order uh, so we can receive profit and thus we can pay dividends okay but whether as a whole i guess that we have answered quite a lot of questions if we haven't answered them you can give us dislikes yes and it is also possible to write answers on the chat i guess that there are quite a lot of questions probably we need to have a separate category technical questions and select most interesting of them for example i found an interesting question from maria Zhuja. Uh, well we haven't discussed it in details yet number one why do you need to build big hangars is it really needed for airships probably it's easier to dig the land well this is an important question the use of airships matter is that when you have a hangar, you can be completely calm in case there is a hurricane that uh, or an earthquake, it can damage it, of course, and uh, when an airship is in the air, its nose is against the wind and its tail is in the direction of the wind. Otherwise, uh, the load on the shell will be too big and it can result uh, in significant uh, slope, significant troll. And uh, I've started the issue of side load. Uh, and uh, there is a specific shape that would allow an airship to uh, to blast the wind parts from different sides and uh, the power is quite high that's why the only way out uh, is locating it in the direction of the wind and actually all these issues all these loads have been started for buildings quite well uh, so there are buildings they are quite heavy and very reliable and an airship has a mast and it has free flight and uh, it can be used it can uh, fly to a platform it uh, can unload and load cargo and it doesn't need anything it doesn't need to have some complicated devices to stay somewhere for some time if this is needed and if it is not needed it can be just loaded and it continues flying but every device has uh, a need of maintenance and there are also periods when uh, it just doesn't need to fly and uh, for this purpose we need to have a hangar where we can close it calmly but when we speak about uh, big devices, just like aircraft that are always flying, continuously used. So if they don't fly, it is considered idle time, but the same is true about airships. So we will learn how to use them in the open air for a long time. 
шарообразности не видно, а камера радует глаз не считается. Вам придется подняться еще выше. Then you will have to go even higher. You know, uh, there are people that believe that the Earth is flat. They are ordering specific optics. Uh, so that uh, the specific optics uh, with specific marks, so they're saying you should just uh, lift this equipment in here and we will measure everything if the Earth is round or not. You should better discuss the financial part. We will discuss the financial part for sure. Today we're discussing technical things and next Thursday we will discuss financial issues. Pavel, are there other questions there? Well, uh, uh, at pre-start there was a question if uh, a dirigible has a rigid frame, why do we uh, why do we use gas for it? Isn't it possible to use vacuum? No, it's not possible to use vacuum, as I said, because uh, if we have uh, this uh, small shell from which it's possible to pump out all the air, then its weight will be such a big that a dirigible uh, will uh, sink. It, it, so, I mean, that it will sink, it will not fly. If uh, you uh, have a barrel with air, it will not sink, but if it has vacuum inside it will sink and there is another question in vk so the question of big space it, and it will not be able to land everywhere due to its size am i right well alexander nikolaevich believes in that he knows quite a lot about these issues how to use them and we also are sure that we will be able uh, to use quite small platforms even in cities to land this airship and uh, indeed it needs a field but still this is not an aerodrome so this uh, field should be approximately well it's like a circle that is the radius of this circle is equal to the length of an airship and there are specific norms so there should be some space around another length of this airship well yes that is for its continuous parking and uh, when it should stop in in the center of the city it can uh, just touch the top part of something so uh, here there is a number of solutions how we will be able to park this airship and it will go around specific points but it's center i mean well yes uh, there are some things that we will develop and uh, we have dynamics for it these are aerodynamic collisions of all the features and loads and quite a lot of efforts are made i also read that there is such an opinion in the pre-start chat in telegram that don't reinvent the wheel why do you need to land dirigibles can crush or when they touch the land it's better to land uh, water because uh, there is more space it is wider in all the airships starting with the yacht finishing with a uh, big airships there is an opportunity to land in water this comment is right it's easier to land an airship on water uh, than the ground well yes actually there was such an airship named Pabieda victory and it could land on water it was used uh, to remove mines from the black sea after the war this is one of the last airships uh, that were used and speaking about history you know there is such a piece of information you can open google or yandex and uh, you can uh, check you know there are some holidays related to airships and one of them will happen really soon and the situation is quite funny it is also related to crowdfunding uh, 
It all happened in the time of Soviet Union. If you find it and send us a link, we will give you a present in the honor of this holiday. But I cannot just speak about it or let it stand and read well. Let them find it because it's interesting. There are several such holidays actually, and we will celebrate them. And uh, one of them, the nearest one, is really interesting. So we'll see it soon. So we will congratulate each other. And as a whole, I do not see more important questions. Actually, there are some questions there as well, but we've been here for a long time. If you're interested, you can resend it, you can give us likes, or we or will cut it a bit, we'll pack it in a more concise format. Okay, so I guess that we can finish now. I guess that that's enough for today. Quite a lot of information has been received. We've been on air for two hours. I can share a bit more technical information with you. Uh, first of all, in VK and YouTube, new generation airships, uh, the most most content will be here. So please sign up not to miss anything. And please make reposts. Quite a lot of people watch us, lots of likes, but you do not want to repost. Uh, but why not? If you make one repost, hundreds of people will learn about the project. You know it yourself. And next time when we start our broadcasting, until we have at least 50 reposts, we uh, should not give the most interesting news. Well, uh, if uh, you know, if we're so late, we will have 50 dislikes rather than reports. Well, yes, indeed, today we had some technical issues, but I think that you did not regret that you attended this webinar. It was really interesting. Thank you, everyone. Mitri Sergeyevich, thanks a lot. See you soon. And all the uh, questions are found on the chat. Yes, Mitri is in our Telegram chat. And if you ask your questions about some technical stuff in the question section, you can find Mitri Sergeyevich there. You can uh, mark him so that he would see that this is a question of him. You can ask a question and he will answer this question. I will try my best to answer. OK, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Bye.